Welcome to Face the Nation. Leslie Stahl is on vacation. I'm Bruce Morton. This broadcast is about AIDS, a bad problem which is going to get much worse. Anybody can get it. Anybody is susceptible. When you have sex with someone today, you also have sex with everyone they've had sex with for the last five or seven years. Roughly 19,000 Americans have died from AIDS. 14,000 have AIDS today. No one has been cured because there is no cure. No one has been immunized because there is no vaccine. Scientists are working on vaccines, but say a solution is, at best, some years away. By the end of 1991, the experts say, 179,000 Americans will have died of AIDS. More than three times as many as died in the Vietnam War. AZT is certainly not a final answer. But the newly released drug, AZT, can slow AIDS, buy time, buy life for its victims. The trouble is, it's very expensive, eight to $10,000 a year. The costs of caring for AIDS victims will soar in the years ahead. You simply can't expect most people to be able to absorb that kind of cost. The problem is large enough that it will be catastrophic. That will, it, it could convulse the healthcare system. AIDS poses many dilemmas. Teaching safe sex can help, but not all Americans support sex education. We can no longer afford to sidestep frank, open discussions about sexual practices heterosexual and homosexual. The public schools have no right to teach children anything except abstinence from sexual activity until they get married. What about testing people to see if they carry the AIDS virus, which can remain dormant for years? Scientists want the knowledge, but what happens if test results leak? If people lose their jobs, if they lose their health insurance because of a positive antibody test result, then we have major problems in this country. If two people want to get married and the one test positive and one negative. What are they going to do? Are they going to forbid the marriage? Are they going to forbid the two from having sex? What can we do about this threat to America's health? We'll ask the Surgeon General, C. Everett Koop. We'll have a debate on testing, and we'll talk to Harvey Feinberg, Dean of the Harvard School of Public Health. AIDS is part of our future, a hard part, posing hard choices, issues facing the nation. From CBS News, Washington, Face the Nation, with CBS News Chief Political Correspondent, Bruce Morton, substituting for Leslie Stahl. We spoke with Surgeon General C. Everett Koop yesterday and asked him how close we are to a cure or a vaccine for AIDS. Well, a cure, I think, uh, is very problematical. Uh, this is a virus, it's hard to kill it. Even if you kill it, you can't change what the virus has done to the tissues. And a vaccine for this very complicated virus I don't think is in the cards for this century. Heavens, uh, there's one French doctor who's already injected himself. Uh, there are well, Americans waiting to go, but, but you don't see it. Well, you see, vaccines take a long time to develop. It took 19 years to develop the uh, vaccine against hepatitis B after we knew where the virus was. Now, this is a much more complicated virus than that. And the mere fact that somebody is testing it on himself or you hear that we're doing uh, preliminary tests, mean we're just doing the very earliest preliminary tests, and before we have a vaccine available for use, is a long way down the pike. You said, Doctor, that uh, the epidemic in this country is, is poorly reported, and that the only way we're really going to get a handle on its size is, is through testing. Uh, what sort of a testing program do you envisage? Well, uh, <clears throat> it's very difficult to talk about testing unless you talk about it in its entirety. Uh, there's such a stigma associated with this disease that uh, you have to be very careful uh, who knows that an individual is zero positive for the AIDS virus because that person could uh, lose his job, he could lose his housing, he could lose his friends. So that has to be carried out with great confidentiality. But there is no doubt about the fact that if we could do that with some broad spectrum of people, we would have a much better handle on the epidemiology of this disease. Uh, this is not simply a, a disease any longer of homosexuals and, and drug users. Oh, absolutely not. It has now gone over uh, into the heterosexual community, and uh, although there are only 4% of those who have AIDS now that are heterosexual, uh, that number is going to mount. Uh, the way we say it is that uh, by 1991, uh, AIDS itself will increase about ninefold, but heterosexual AIDS will increase about twentyfold. What kind of testing do you see then? Uh, uh, something random like people being admitted to hospitals? Uh, that would be one way to do it. Uh, of course, the confidentiality has to be ensured, uh, and uh, that is always a problem. 
Now, uh, the government has also suggested that people who had blood transfusions in the last 10 years get the test. And uh, I read that in New York, for instance, they're queued up to where you have to wait several weeks now. Are, are too many people who don't need to be tested getting tested? Well, I think that that was misunderstood. Uh, what the government really said was that if you had had multiple transfusions in those areas of the country where the virus was prevalent uh, in the period in question, then it would be good to go and see your doctor and be counseled. And I think that was misinterpreted by many people to say, gee, I had a transfusion, I better run off and get tested. What about pregnant women? Ought they to be tested? Well, you know, I've been, been so misquoted on this, I'd like to make it clear. Well, that I, I thought we'd give you a chance to. <laughs> all right, thank you. I have not changed my position on abortion at all. Uh, I am still opposed to it and would not recommend it. However, I think that any woman who is pregnant uh, and is uh, seropositive for the AIDS virus is entitled to the option of abortion counseling if she so desires. If um, you were a pregnant woman, you, you would want to take the test? I certainly would. No cure in sight, uh, no vaccine anytime soon, so we come back to what seems to be the central question, which is education. Yes, do sir. You, do you first, Dr. Coop, really believe that you can change people's behavior by education. We did a lot of anti-smoking stuff in this country, and you still have women and teens smoking quite a lot. Well, but, but look at the positive side. Since Luther Terry's report in 1964, smokers have come down from 55% to 28, but we can't wait that long for AIDS. Now, we do have some little cohorts that we've studied where we do know that uh, education does have an effect on people who are prone to have AIDS. The homosexual community did listen uh, to our early uh, concerns about education, and homosexual behavior dropped off in its promiscuity very dramatically, and that is good. We also have available studies done in other countries uh, with cohorts of men who use prostitutes uh, and with the prostitutes themselves. And uh, the men have, uh, about 50% of them have stopped seeing prostitutes, uh, about 35 percent have cut down, and uh, the prostitutes certainly confirm that business has fallen off. If education is the answer, Dr. Coop, uh, is the federal government spending enough? Eighty million dollars this year is not, by government standards, a ton of money. Well, I, th I think that's true, but on the other hand, it's the first time that we've had that much money. And right now, uh, the Centers for Disease Control are letting contracts with advertising agencies. They're doing public service announcements, and uh, I think that with a boost in the budget next year, we're well on the way to doing the right thing about education. Uh, at the moment, we're using about a quarter of our AIDS budget for education, and in as much as the budget's gone up every year, I see that as a hopeful sign, and I think we can uh, make do with uh, the money we have. Would it uh, help this education process, though, if Mr. Reagan came out and, and spoke to American young people? Uh, I, I don't know whether uh, young people would believe the president on a health matter any more than they believe the Surgeon General. I just think that uh, we have to keep hammering away at it. Uh, it's a repetitive message, but it's life-saving. Surgeon General C. Everett Coop. We'll be right back. One of the issues in the AIDS debate is testing. What good does it do? What harm can it do? To talk about that, we've invited Fred Wolf, who's the AIDS coordinator of the Colorado State Department of Health, and Thomas Stoddard, executive director of the Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund, the Homosexual Rights Group. Uh, Mr. Wolf, let me start with you. Uh, tell me a little about what testing Colorado does, which, as I understand it, is uh, voluntary so far. Yes, all testing in Colorado is voluntary, but we have a very aggressive testing program. Once the test was licensed, we came right out of the chutes advocating testing for people who were at risk for HIV infection, people who were in risk groups. And to date, uh, we've tested on a per capita basis uh, people that puts us in the top two or three states within the country. It is voluntary, it is confidential, but it is not anonymous or secret testing. Well, it's confidential, but if somebody comes out positive, uh, don't you try to follow up and identify uh, their sexual contacts? Uh, absolutely, and that's absolutely essential. Uh, for example, uh, about 10% of people who test positive don't come back for their test results. And in following up those people to get their positive results to them and provide them with counseling so they won't put others at risk, 
we find that most people didn't come back just because they didn't get around to it, not because they changed their mind about the test. But then you're, you're, you're going to other people who, you know, uh, person B who doesn't know that person A has been tested and saying, listen, uh, we've got some news for you. Exactly. What we'll do is we'll talk with people who are positive and we'll offer our services to inform other people who are at risk to encourage them to be tested. We're not naive enough to believe that general education will prompt all those individuals who are at risk to be tested. Many people need to see the x-ray with a spot on the lung in order to uh, motivate them to do the right thing. And our experience has been with people who we've offered this service to, uh, the experience has been that individuals really would prefer that we do it because it's much greater protection of their privacy. And of course, the whole process is entirely confidential. Mr. Stoddard, uh, risks in this? Very great risks. Uh, first of all, I'm appalled that Colorado, Colorado would describe its testing program as confidential when those who are seropositive must have, by law, their names and addresses kept on a state file. Colorado is one of a number of states that now do this, uh, and there are indications that the system doesn't work. Uh, there are a substantial number of people in Colorado who now give false names. In fact, I'm informed that it's above 40%. They give Donald Duck or Ronald Reagan instead of John Smith. And they do it because they are afraid of having their name and address kept on a file, quite understandably. In the context of AIDS, discrimination can be rampant. People have lost their jobs. People uh, jeopardize their insurability by, uh, by being identified with AIDS. But let me, if I can, Bruce, let me indicate that I think that the question that you asked initially may be the wrong question. Uh, and therefore, we're getting the wrong answer. Uh, the question should not be necessarily, should we be testing? The question should be the underlying question of what can we do to prevent further spread of the virus? Now, the test may be useful in an entirely voluntary context where there is anonymity assured and there's no cost charged to the people who want to take the test. But on a mandatory basis, the test would be totally counterproductive to the public health. There is no medical intervention now for people who are positive, so the test isn't helpful to identify treatments or people who need treatments. Uh, on the other hand... The well, it is helpful, presumably, to, to well, figure out the size of the problem. Well, it can be for epidemiological reasons, that is, for purposes of determining the spread of the virus, but you don't have to keep names and addresses on file in order to do that. California well, and New York have a very, very large case point, load. go back to, uh, to you, Mr. Wolf, and ask, uh, first of all, are you getting a lot of D-Ducks and, and R. Reagan? <laughs> so, well, we have a few D-Ducks and R. More Reagan. More than 40 percent. And in, fact, uh, and in fact, we have a few F wolves as well. Uh, that's okay. What, in the follow-up that I described to you early, uh, earlier, what we find is that even though someone might use a pseudonym, uh, over 75% of the people that we've had to follow up have given us sufficient information to find them. I think this reflects that people intuitively understand the importance of not being tested secretly. So have you, have you had leaks? Has, has anybody in Colorado come to you and said, listen, because of you guys, I lost my job, I lost my insurance? I Absolutely lost. not. What I'd like to say is that, and let me, let me just say this. I have this, a story about Colorado to tell wait, in a moment. <laughs> you can, I, I also have a story. <laughs> uh, the director of the uh, Colorado American Civil Liberties Union in testimony before a Senate committee last week on an AIDS bill uh, admitted publicly that Colorado has an absolutely unblemished record at protecting confidentiality. Now, there's a great deal of misinformation that's been carried through the media around the country and has been accepted at face value without other people checking out the facts of the story. Story two. Your story two. A 17-year-old boy was suspended from a public high school in Denver once the school found out that he was seropositive. Now, they found out not through the system of the public health, Thanks. but the superintendent of schools then called upon publicly the public health department to turn over the names of other students who were seropositive. Now, to their credit, the department did not turn over those names, but there's nothing to stop the superintendent from going to the legislature in Colorado and saying, give me those names now that the list exists. Is there any prospect, well, you, well, legislature is the magic word well, the, here, no, the any point prospect is, of any kind of mandatory testing uh, being authorized by the legislature? No, there is no pros prospect for mandatory testing. And our, our opinion is at this point in time, mandatory testing is not appropriate. Let's go let, back let me to ask the you about one other bill that I understand is somewhere in your state legislative right. process, and that's a bill which, as I understand it, would allow the state to detain people who tested positive and continued promiscuous behavior. Tell me about that. Well, and part of that bill greatly strengthens our ability to protect confidentiality. And in fact, the story that Mr. Stoddard just told, I think, is an example of how well confidentiality has been protected. Public health did not release any information. The biggest danger to confidentiality is the patient releasing the information themselves. 
Now, this bill greatly strengthens our ability to maintain the confidentiality of those records, which is good now, but uh, we want to improve that. The bill also then follows up on reporting regulations, which we have, because without reporting, public health is, is left impotent to fight this epidemic. The bill also greatly restricts public health's ability to quarantine or isolate or place restrictions on people. Because we need at all times to get back to the underlying question. What can we do as a society to teach people how to protect themselves so that the virus will not spread further? The test, if it is applied in a mandatory fashion, uh, if test results are required to rep be reported to the government, will create an inherently adversarial relationship between the individuals most at risk and the government. That is precisely what we don't need. We need a public health system that, that makes people believe in the government and that works with the government toward a common solution. What about this idea, of, 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 which I understand is part of this bill, of the state uh, being able to detain someone who is positive and who continues a promiscuous uh, style of Well, it's generally a terrible idea to detain people um, uh, for this reason. Uh, first of all, not every kind of sexual act is dangerous. Only certain kinds of sexual acts involving penetration. Uh, that means that it really won't serve much purpose to detain people um, because others can protect themselves if they wish to. What we really need in this country is further education. We need people to know what to do to protect themselves. Uh, AIDS is not like tuberculosis. It's not spread unwillingly against a population that can't protect itself. This population can protect itself if it gets the necessary information and knows what to do. And we're not having that now in Colorado or in any other state. Colorado is not educating its citizens sufficiently. It's not doing the most logical thing, which is public service announcements, billboards, um, every means possible to tell people what they should and should not do in the context of AIDS. I, I think that, that this is blowing things out of context. Colorado is clearly educating people, uh, are there clearly doing everything. Yes, there are, in fact, many public service Television announcements. Television and radio? Where Colorado differs is that Colorado is not naive enough to rely simply on education. We're trying to use all the tools at our disposal to, uh, to control this epidemic. What do you do out of 1,500 people that we know are positive and infectious? We've only had to consider any kind of restrictive measures twice. So the first thing you have to do is put that restrictive kind of uh, uh, measure into context. The second thing you have to do uh, is to do that with adequate due process. Thank you. We're out of time, Mr. Wolf. Mr. Stoddard, thank you. We'll be right back. <laughs> you're always looking for an overview, somebody with a big, long-range perspective. To give us that kind of a look at AIDS, we've invited Dr. Harvey Feinberg, the Dean of Harvard University School of Public Health. Dr. Feinberg, uh, let me start just by asking you about scale a little. Uh, Dr. Coop earlier said he thought uh, they were getting about enough money for education, uh, education research, all of it. Uh, are we spending what we ought to be spending? In my opinion, we're not even close. To deal comprehensively with the AIDS epidemic, we have to have a strategy that attacks the problem at three levels. First, we have to provide compassionate care for those patients who have AIDS. Secondly, we have to work as hard as we can to educate the nation about the risks of AIDS and how people can protect themselves. And thirdly, we need to invest the necessary resources into research that may lead to the development of an effective vaccine and more effective treatment. Dr. Koop, I think, rightly and truthfully speaks to the American public about the dangers of AIDS and what we need to do. Where I would differ with Dr. Koop's statements is really on the question of magnitude, where we are today and where we have to be. Consider the problem of educating the American public. It is true that the government this year is assigning or requesting the assignment of funds to the Centers for Disease Control in the amount of about $80 million to educate the public about AIDS. That amount of money is less money than one company, Procter & Gamble, spent to market two new products, Liquid Tide and Crest Tartar Control Formula. Let me, let me uh, interrupt, Doctor, to ask you, uh, does education work? Are you, can you really substantially modify public behavior by education? We don't know how well different strategies on education are going to work to deal with a problem as fundamental as sexual behavior and other risk activities like use of intravenous drugs. 
the challenge to us as a society is to develop a series of strategies to try out in education. Let's find out what works. Let's bring together the best minds that we can in the areas of education, advertising, marketing, health, and, ed and education generally, and let's see what we can come up with that will reach the American public and lead to the kinds of behavior change that are going to protect people against this disease. Let me, let me uh, turn in another direction. Uh, you mentioned compassionate care. Uh, I read in uh, newspaper clippings that uh, this problem may cost $70 billion a year within four or five years. Now, even, even in Washington, even by government standards, that is very serious money. Uh, what are we to do about that? The figure of $70 billion may apply to an estimate over a period of time. The Public Health Service and the National Academy of Sciences Institute of Medicine panels made an estimate that by the year 1991, the annual costs of the care of patients who have full-blown AIDS, the clinical disease, would be in the order of 8 to $16 billion per year, still a sizable amount. Is, is the solution uh, getting people out of hospitals and into some other kind of uh, environment, a, a convalescent home? A very important part of the strategy for care that would be both less expensive and more compassionate is an emphasis on home care, community-based services, keeping people out of hospital. It's been clear from what we've learned so far that those communities that do a better job of caring for people in their homes also care for them better and less expensively. Let me raise uh, one other uh, issue with you, Doctor, and that is the, the complaints by uh, some of the, uh, of the affected groups, homosexual groups in particular, that the testing of new drugs is too slow, that, well, AZT is on the market, but there are others that, that ought to be on the market. Uh, is the FDA dragging its feet in your view? I don't believe the FDA is dragging its feet. The FDA has a strong uh, orientation toward protecting the public and including patients with AIDS against bad drugs. We think of AZT as a success. We forget an earlier drug called Suramin that turned out to be a terrible and dismal failure. I do believe that the FDA could move more effectively in making available drugs in proper testing situations to apply to patients with AIDS. We need, in other words, to make the drugs more widely available, but in a context where we learn about how effective they are in a scientifically controlled fashion. More money for education, uh, more testing of more drugs uh, in the 45 seconds or so that we have left. Uh, what else uh, would you have us do? I think a very important point is that at the present time, we're going into the AIDS epidemic, in effect, in the dark. We need to have a better idea of just how widespread this disease is and how quickly it is spreading in the population. To do that means surveillance. It means testing, and I would urge that we have a surveillance strategy that is anonymous in testing. We don't have to identify the individuals who are positive to know how widespread the disease is at a particular point in time. Dr. Feinberg, thank you. We're out of time. Thank you. I'm Bruce Morton. Leslie Stahl will be back next week.